A big warm welcome, everyone, and we'll get started in one minute right on time. And it's a real pleasure to see all of you here and to talk about soil health and policy and how we can use some of the momentum from the COPs into the future. Great, and Manyewu is joining, Sabrina, great. Good afternoon, Lee. Oh, great, hi, good, good, good. Excellent, I was just wondering if you had slides, if you're gonna wanna share your screen, that's also possible. Some slides from my side there. Okay, fantastic. Great, and I see more people joining, amazing. Okay, so a big warm welcome everyone. I'm Lee Winnewicki, I'm a soil scientist. I also lead the soil and land health research theme at C4E Craft based in Nairobi, Kenya. And I also am one of the co-founders of the Coalition of Action for Soil Health. And we are so thrilled to kickstart this webinar series on our road toward the Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit. Now, one of the key um, ingredients is policy and looking for opportunities to integrate soil health into policies. And so we've brought together a, a, an amazing panel of experts with actual experience and solutions to share. So we're super thrilled. So this is um, the, the, the road ahead for soil health action, creating an enabling policy environment for soil health. And the objectives of today are very simple. One, bring together soil policy advocates, share their experiences, expertise, in really integrating soil health into policy frameworks. Two, identify key entry points for the rest of us <laughs> who want to integrate soil health into policies. And when I say policies, I want to highlight that this includes environmental policies. Agricultural policies is generally what we think of, but also climate change policies and also ecosystem restoration declarations and strategies. And finally, really connecting audiences. For those of you who are members of the Coalition of Action for Soil Health, it's really about building this network, sharing experiences, connecting audiences. So we have an hour and a half for this webinar, but we're really leaving like 30 minutes if possible um, to you know, have as much discussion, ask hard questions to our panelists, be ready panelists. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to show you the who is on our panel, um, and we'll start off with a, a. I'll give a brief introduction. We have a keynote from um, Mr. Mutamba, and then we have um, Jack Hanum, Hasib, and Professor Mbabazi, and we have a youth representative, Jenna um, Mateus, and uh, Asan Ngombe from Agra. So you can see, I'm sure everyone knows who all these people are. They'll introduce themselves, but this is a really um, diverse voices here. Now, I'll just give a few slides on what is the Coalition of Action for Soil Health. We have a big goal, improve soil health globally by addressing implementation, monitoring, policy and investment barriers, four targets. And you can see our first target, which is why our first webinar of the year is on policy. How can we integrate soil health considerations in policy? The second target is how can we expand research and development? So Jack will also tell you she's really into soil health monitoring and mapping and data systems. And how can we use these data to answer remaining questions on how land management influences soil health? We have a target to increase the number of hectares of land under healthy soil practices. And then our last webinar in this series is actually on investment. So how can we really engage with private sector, public sector to increase financial invent investments to incentivize farmers to invest in their soil? We have 167 
members from research, farmer organizations, government, private sector, and we keep growing. We have two new members just this week, one from an international organization and one from an NGO in uh, Gabon. So we're, or in the, so we're so excited. We love bridging these gaps. We have, do a lot on communication and engagement, advocacy, implementation and fundraising and multi-stakeholder engagement. And I think you'll see from this webinar and the partners represented um, how some of this core work that we've been doing. Um, if you are a member, you'll see a number of your flagship initiatives on the website. So we have over 27 flagships that really are projects, implementation on the ground, uh, that really adhere to the four targets of the coalition. We're on uh, Twitter, I mean X, and LinkedIn, and we have lots of uh, exciting ways to engage with newsletters and newsroom. And I'm just going to highlight two recent uh, policy um, work that we've done. So if you go to our website under policy, you can see some of the Australian or European Union soil strategies. And we also have produced a number of policy briefs identifying key entry points for integrating um, soil health into the nationally determined contributions. These policy briefs are from Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, I, I think it will link nicely to what Hasib will talk about of how to really support countries better um, for including soil health and NDCs. I'm here in Kenya. 80% of Kenya is rangelands. So we are not going to meet the NDCs by, by restoring forests. It's going to be by you know, sequestering carbon in the soil. And then finally, we have our soil health resolution that we launched at COP27. We got soil health, uh, enhancing soil health into um, the UAE Food Systems Declaration. And now we have a big goal, a big goal to get a soil health resolution at the UN General Assembly. So if you or your institution um, are available to support this, um, please let us know because this is uh, really tangible. So with that um, kind of speed fire uh, introduction into some of the work that we're doing at the Coalition of Action for Soil Health, I'm so pleased um, that despite the multiple uh, engagements um, that Maniewu has uh, allocated some time for us to hear his wisdom, he is the head of agriculture um, at the African Union, and He's been engaged to support soil health at multiple levels. He has more energy and passion for this than most people. And we're so pleased uh, to have you here, uh, Mr. Mutamba. So the floor is yours. A big, warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia. And it's a pleasure to be here and to interact with uh, many of you online and uh, many of you who share a similar passion uh... maybe um i've jinxed him because i've been having terrible internet all week and i finally have decent internet <laughs> so um i know what it's like when your uh internet uh, freezes so perhaps we give Manyewu a minute to see if that can be restored. Um, <laughs> so sorry, Manyewu. So we will remove spotlight. And um, yes, uh, Manyewu has also been involved with the Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit, which will be he here in Nairobi from the 7th to 9th in May of this year. And in case you aren't sure what that is, um, there was the Abuja Summit, which was called the what? Anyone know? Africa Fertilizer Summit. Oh, you're back. Manyewu, excellent. Oh my, God, my apologies, my connectivity is not great. I, I will switch off my, my video and hopefully this helps. Um, let me go through a few points quickly before I get disconnected again. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, to this webinar and to this discussion on such a critical you know topic. And also, I must say, coming at uh, 
such an opportune and such a pivotal time, particularly for the African continent, because this moment is such a pivotal moment for issues of all health, because finally we are seeing the level of political uh, awareness, commitment, and awakening that I believe is, is, has been missing for, for, for far too long. You know, 2024 is going to be a pivotal year for the African continent for this subject. And um, when it comes to solve out, I have no doubt at this point in time that finally the realization that Africa cannot talk about the transformation of food systems without realizing that we need to invest in health. So I believe that message is finally arrived and we see that with um, you know the, the kind of momentum that is you know reached the highest levels of government on the African continent. The extent of the problem you know for Africa, you know just the awareness on the extent of the problem and what it means for, for food systems uh, on the continent, what it means for climate efforts, I believe it has reached a time, you know, a, a level that uh, we've never seen in the past. And I believe um, this is our moment to really take advantage of this level of political awareness and the momentum that has been generated with, uh, with, with this. I'm sure many of you are aware that Africa has planned a Fertilizer and soil health summits to be held in, in May this year. To me, this is the highlight in terms of awareness, in terms of commitment to addressing many issues that are pivotal for soil health. And I believe this is an opportunity for us to engage with the highest level of our political, uh, you know, highest levels of policy making and politics on our continent to really emphasize you know, the importance of soil health and the significance of healthy soils in, in transforming food systems for our continent. This is an opportunity for us to present concrete, compelling proposals in terms of the actions that we believe are required if we are to turn you know, the page with respect to soil health on the continent. You know, so for me, you know, I've been at the at the center of preparations for this summit, and I've been privileged to work with many of you, but also others that are passionate about this and knowledgeable about what needs to happen and why it is so fundamental and such an imperative for food system transformation. I've been leading a technical working group that is compiled key inputs, technical inputs, experiences, lessons from across the continent and beyond in terms of what actions are required, the kind of actions that we want our member states to commit to. And we are going to take advantage of this summit to get commitment and political you know, you know, awareness at the highest level to commit to the, these actions. And we want this to direct action at the national level. We want this to almost, uh, you know, become a template in terms of how countries are going to come up with their own national plans, you know, to address issues of soil health and exactly how we are going to build capacity, how we're going to support investments. Lee, early on, you spoke about how to ensure that farmers can actually invest in, in soil health. This is well, you know, you know, the, the rubber hits the the road. If farmers don't do anything, then we are not going to make progress. So what kind of support, what are those mechanisms that we need to put in place to support farmers to take action uh, to address issues of soil health? So we believe this is the, this is the beginning of uh, a sustained effort that will be required to really formulate you know, meaningful proposals in terms of how to take, you know, to take action, how to take things forward on the African continent and to move beyond, you know, nice speeches and 
you know, nice plans on paper and to actually support action on the ground. In short, I should say, I really look forward to, to, to working with many of you and seeing concrete proposals being, you know, made and commitments being made at the continental level and these being, you know, you know, domesticated at the local level, at the national level to take impact. So for me, this is a pivotal year and we all need to engage. We need to bring all our good work to bear and take advantage of this process and contribute, bring those inputs from many years of work I know many of you have experiences and lessons from many years of work that could really shape, you know, the future in terms of what Africa, you know, does and how we approach, you know, and tackle this uh, very important uh, topic. Let me stop there and I want to thank you again for this invitation and uh, I wish you uh, fruitful deliberations for this afternoon and uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Ali. Thank you so much. Let's give uh, Maniewu a big, everyone give him a round of applause. Um, not just for these words, but for literally losing sleep for the last 18 months to pull these uh, con member states together uh, around uh, Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit. And uh, Mr. Mutamba, I was saying that we had the Abuja Summit, and that was actually called the Africa Fertilizer Summit. And I think because of the work of everyone on this call, we now are having an Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit. And I just think that, you know, we can take some small wins whenever we get them, right? So I, I, it really goes to you, your dedication, your leadership, and really what you have set the scene is a tangible engagement with member states to integrate and implement healthy soil practices on the ground. So through the declaration and then the summit and getting member states to commit to um, certain practices or investments. So I think that that is a really, um, you know, helpful uh, roadmap for us. And I just wanted to appreciate um that works. So thank you again. Big round of applause. And thanks for being here. <laughs> so now I'm so pleased that um, we have this panel here um, that I'm going to start uh, with our uh, representative from the British Society of Soil Science. Um, so we'll go one by one. I have a few questions and we'll make sure we have time for, for other questions. So um, first, uh, Jack, please, first just introduce yourself and then I'll, I'll get uh, ready for some difficult questions for you. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining and, and thanks to Cash for the invite to uh, to give some of our insights here today. Uh, I'm Jack Hannum. I'm the current president of the British Society of Soil Science. We're a membership organisation that um, are members from not just academia, but also people putting soils into practice in uh, business and um, other forms of, um, of sectors. Um, we publish a couple of um, international journals as well. So our members are really kind of the, the foundation of expertise behind um, a lot of soil science, both in the UK and, and internationally, obviously, as well. Um, my day job is actually a, a lecturer at Cranfield University. So I'm a soil scientist, as Lee mentioned earlier, working with kind of soil data and soil health. So, so that's me. Great, great. So today we're talking about Cross learning, right? So we start. We started in Africa, as uh, I we always have a tendency to do. <laughs> now we're jumping to the UK. So perhaps you could just talk to us a bit about what's going on in the UK. I always uh, love the title, you know, the uh, soil inquiry, and then also perhaps something about your recent experience in Canada and how your it, it, what's happening in the UK um, and the soil uh, space is also informing other governments. And then any you know helpful hints for those of us who want to influence our government. So over to you, you can tackle in any order. And all those questions, yeah. I guess um, I, I might start with the last one actually, uh, just about what the society has been doing. So historically, we haven't been involved that much with kind of um, policy advocacy, but we um, 
through the inquiry is one of the big things that we've been doing, but we've also been engaging with policymakers in the UK uh, by inviting them to our meetings so they can actually talk to the researchers directly, look at the current evidence for soils, both in terms of what, you know, what's happening in terms of the state of our soils, but those sorts of solutions that the researchers and the practitioners that they're working with are coming up with. So th this has been a really um, important part of our work where we're bringing them to the table with the discussions. And it's a two way process where they also presented some of their um, policy priorities for soils at our annual meeting actually in December. So, so one is like cross fertilizing between that us and them, if you like. Um, the second one, it, it was um, initiated by the government itself actually, but, but from various um, uh, push pull from various groups to actually look at the state of soils in the UK. So there was this soil health inquiry last year in the UK. Um, and yes, it is an inquiry. So this was a committee that is based of different members of parliament in government. So it's not just from, from government that is in, in power at the moment, but cross party looking at particular issues. Um, and we had in the International Year of Soil in 2015, we had an inquiry. So it's been some time since then. So we wanted to reflect on what happened, but it also look at the kind of key policy and legislation that was currently in place for soils in the UK and whether that was fit for purpose or not. Um, and there were multiple groups. It was, it was excellent because there were multiple voices, not just from, from the learning societies, but from across the sector that were able to put forward evidence for that. And the inquiries just published its report. You may have seen it uh, at the end of the last year. Um, and some of those key recommendations that have, have been put forward by uh, the groups that gave evidence with talking about sort of policies. So there is no overarching policy for soils in the UK. Soil policy is actually devolved to different nations. So England has a policy team, so does Scotland, so does Wales, so does Northern Ireland. And they all have slightly different approaches to integrating policy uh, related to soils in, into those different policies. So I'd like to sort of touch, I think, again, Lee, on your comments about it's not just about agriculture. That is where the main focus is, is at the moment. So we, at least from a national perspective, we have a policy window at the moment because we came out of the EU. So there's this huge reform in agricultural policy currently in the UK, in all four nations. And we see that as an opportunity then to embed soil health into those kind of agricultural policies that are currently being developed. Everyone has you know, also these international targets. So we start to think about other policy areas, for example, like net zero is a massive one in the UK. So thinking about everybody's overarching commitments actually to the Paris Agreement, which are determining some of those national um, policies and also the, the recent um, Convention on, on Biodiversity as well. So those are, again, other drivers where we can see different policy teams can actually start to implement soil health into, into their policy development to address those. So I'm not sure if I answered all of that, but hopefully no, I think that's, <laughs> that's really a flavor of what we're doing. I think it's really helpful. And especially your first point of invite people to the room, to the conversation. Yeah. That's something we can all action. And then I was just wondering, could you tell us what you were doing in Canada and what that experience was like? So another inquiry, it's like being, I don't know, in a courtroom or something <laughs> without a judge, but it's very much similar, I guess, there's similarities between the UK and Canada doing that in some respects, but, um, you know, they're, they're inviting people then to, to, to give evidence. So in, the, in that case, of course, they're talking about soils in Canada, but they were keen, like you are now, exactly like you're doing now, is to, to think about, well, what's happening? How can we learn from what other people are doing, um, both through the inquiry, but what sorts of practices are being developed um, in terms of um, beneficial practices for soil health, what policy mechanisms are, are available, at which level in the sort of policy landscape are they? Are they up at the international agreements and or are they right down on the ground? And also, um, you know, how we can facilitate that transition, so how we can facilitate the people that are actually going to be affected by those policies. So farming community primarily 
and to enable them to to transition to, to to practices that are beneficial for soils. So it's all very well setting a direct from the travel, but if there's nothing that can support that change, um, then you're never going to realise those policy ambitions with, without those structures in place. And those will differ from place to place. In the UK, we part of that is is public finance potentially through some subsidy systems where we're kind of rewarding farmers for all sorts of kind of environmental benefits there's place for the private market so it's really great to see you've got another you know um, webinar about, about financing so really you know, how how do we incentivize people on the ground to ensure that that um, we can implement those sorts of policies Great. Thank you so much. And thank you also for taking the time to engage with Canada. And I think we're already seeing a consortium of countries coming forward that may want to think about uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly resolution on soil health. So yeah. uh, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Jack. And so Thanks, Lee. We'll, we'll open it up at the end for questions. But if people have questions now, they can answer, uh, put them in the chat. And I'm looking for Pamela. Um, Pamela and Babazi, so we can, yes, co we're coming back to Africa. So we, we gave, you know, another continent <laughs> five minutes. So we're back, back to Africa and I'm so pleased. Hi, um, Pamela, you are the executive chairperson for the National Planning Authority of Uganda. And is that Grace in the background? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Pamela, I, I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, and then I would love for you to share with us some of the critical mechanisms that are needed to enable soil health to be better integrated into policy. You can feel free to speak as specific as you want, which entry points in Uganda, what is your ask for anyone else in the audience or the panel, um, so that we can really bring soil health into um into the policy sphere so please the floor is yours introduce yourself tell us your mission um introduce everyone thank you very much Lair. and i had switched off my um video because we don't have good internet connectivity so when you don't hear me just let me know i'll have to switch off but my names are pamela babazi i chair the national planning i'm an executive chairperson of the National Planning Authority. And right yeah. here is um, um, uh, Grace Wenje, who is in charge of agriculture at the Planning Authority. And I needed him to be here so that we can really see how we can um, uh, learn from this conversation and, and uh, continue the processes that we're um, championing here in Uganda. So my um, uh, role at the authority really is to um, rally, rally my team in planning for the Uganda we want, uh, a Uganda that of course is, 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 is transformational, one that has, uh, is able to feed its people, that has food security, but one of the key factors of production is land. And we need to have a soil that is healthy. And therefore we're very pleased that you have invited us to be a part of this conversation. And we're very passionate to ensure that we have the requisite, the requisite uh, frameworks and policies that can enable us um, have uh, critical uh, and, and, and ideal soil health uh, in this country. Because we do understand the importance of soil health, but we also recognize the need to have that conducive milieu, the right frameworks, the right policies in place. But even underlying all this is the awareness, the right awareness and appreciation that we need to accord the issue of soil health, the urgency and, 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 and priority that it deserves. And therefore, in answer to your question, really, as a country, we do um, and, and have signed, uh, of course, our, our commitment to be part of, of, of you know, this coalition uh, on, on soil health. But more importantly, we have um, tried to push conversations and engagements to the critical stakeholders, stakeholder institutions, particularly the Minister of Agriculture, Industry and Fisheries, to begin uh, the formulation, but also fast tracking the um, conversations and engagements of instituting the uh, soil health policy for the country. Um, because 
Uganda, though, with very uh, good soils, they are being eroded very fast, and our population is growing very fast. And therefore, we need to be quick in addressing and arresting the situation to ensure that this country that God gave us can actually sustain us because the population uh, is growing rapidly and we need to be deliberate and intentional about how we protect uh, um, and, and, and accentuate uh, soil health. So really, I think the most important ask that we have now is to be supported in um, formulating the right soil health policy and working particularly with the experts in the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries to ensure we get it right because we don't um, um, have the luxury of, 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 of getting it wrong, if I may put it that way. And therefore, um, honest, uh, timely, uh, well-informed conversations yeah. of what the key critical situation is on the ground is important and, and ensuring how and the kind of roadmap we need to have in place to ensure that we get it right. Of course, I'm aware that some countries um, have already uh, established um, these policies. So making it uh, easy and possible for us to benchmark and, and have um, um, uh, you know, a reference point of what we need to have in place, I think would be a good thing. But also um, working with us on the ground to have more uh, conscientization, sensitization, awareness raising uh, engagements. And I'm talking about uh, being very systematic and deliberate about it because we do have at the highest level, I am a member of cabinet, but we, we, we or whereas conversations can be there, I think we need to have different levels of raising, not just the Minister of Culture, but Ministry of Water, Ministry of um, you know, Local Government, um, the, at the farm level, and the local government. So we would like to, to work with you and all the different stakeholders and see how can we uh, raise awareness so that everybody appreciates and is a part of that. So broadly, I think um, those are the issues I would wish to share with you and I'll pause there for now and uh, entertain any other uh, question. Thank you. So Pamela, was that an, an invitation for us to come to Uganda? That's what I heard. <laughs> it's better to be here, certainly. Uh, but if we can, uh, if it's not possible quickly, then let's have, um, you know, Zoom meetings. Uh, but even more importantly, coming on the ground would be even better. And I also wanted to point out that you said this is urgent. And also when we're developing policies, it absolutely we want to get it right as much as we can um, because it's such a, an, an investment, right? With time, energy, and all um, bringing all these people together. So I really think that this kind of learning event and knowledge sharing is so important um, so that we can try as much as possible. And I hope hope that you and your team will be coming to the Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit in May. Um, we can talk about this offline, but I think your, your leadership and Uganda's, um, you know, a, acknowledgement of the importance of soil health and integration into policy, would it would be great to highlight that. And then, um, yeah, I just wanted to really appreciate you and all of your engagement through the UN Food Systems Summit and your leadership to really make sure that soil health, food systems, systems are integrated into a, into something that's implementable, operational on the ground. So thank you so much, Pamela, and thank you, Grace. And any other um, any other one minute comment you want to make, Pamela, the floor is yours. I think for me, it's more of um, ensuring that we all um, set our targets and ensure that um, we uh, implement like I said, as the National Planning Authority, we are already uh, having deep conversations on how we can integrate uh, issues of um, enhancing, accentuating, promoting soil health as part of the key targets in the plan. Uh, because the National Development Plan 3 is ending next year, and we've started the thinking and formulation process for National Development Plan 4. And I've been working with the team together with Grace and, and the technical team at NPA 
to ensure that we put specific targets that will enable us to hold the whole of government accountable to deliver in ensuring that we work towards uh, promoting soil health and, and certainly uh, working with you to ensure that we articulate well what we can measure and what we can commit ourselves to achieve and work together to mobilize the funding necessary to enable us implement, I think is critical. So I see this as a partnership. I see this as a need to encourage each other and to hold each other accountable to deliver results. I thank you. Great, thank you so much. And thanks for bringing up the mention of quantifiable, measurable targets. And this also aligns with the question in the chat. So maybe Danielle, if you could put a link to the policy briefs where we um, talk about monitoring soil carbon. So thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you, Grace. And we look forward to being on this journey together with you. Fantastic. Awesome. And now we'll, we'll, we're going to stay in Africa. And because we're talking about policy and we're talking about um, Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit, my next panelist is Asan Ngombe. And I have been told that he is here. So Asan, I hope you'll... Yay! Great! So Asan literally just got off a plane and he's so committed to this topic that he has agreed to speak to us. He can't stay the whole time, but um, I'm so pleased that you're here, resilience officer at the at Agra. So I'll allow you to introduce yourself and kind of what your work focuses on, and then just give you an opportunity to share some of the tangible work that Agra is doing to influence policy, how you're engaging with the Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit. And then I may or may not have some follow-up questions. Asan, over to you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Lee. Um, always a pleasure to be on a panel with you. Um, you introduced me so eloquently. Um, I feel like I shouldn't even carry on talking about who I am. Uh, but nonetheless, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this um, distinguished group of experts. Uh, my name is Asan Ngombe. And I am uh, one of the experts in Agra, uh, and my area of work is broadly resilience, and I focus quite a bit on climate change, uh, which touches uh, on soils as well. Um, so with regard to what we're discussing today, um, I will really just talk through some of the key issues um, that Agra has been doing uh, on the ground and how we're relating these to issues of policy. And, and in mind currently, I mean, let me just focus on our project on regenerative agriculture that we have been implementing here in Kenya. And I may bring in other examples um, because this is building on other uh, work that has been happening in the past. So this, this work really focuses on how we can build a regenerative landscape within Kenya's agriculture systems. And we have uh, a number of objectives. Number one is to actually demonstrate that regenerative practices have uh, an impact, positive impact on soils, but as well as a whole circular economy that we build uh, of smallholder farmers, uh, off takers, SMEs, uh, et cetera. And the key component in there is how do we uh, build policy within this space? And what we are finding out um, on this project and how we're working with the county government, um, main, main, much of it we've realized that we actually need data, we need information, we need evidence, we need those decision points that allow policymakers to swing policy in favor of areas such as um, soil health. Um, it is really a complex environment because there is no one pol single policy that actually deals with uh, soil. So it's, a, it's a many policies. And I'll give you an example of the way the county government structures its annual budgeting process with regard to the type of inputs that it promotes for uh, agriculture seasons. The type of fertilizer policy affects soils. The type of environmental policies affects soils. How they plan their livelihood across the many sectors that are land-based also affects soils. So how we've been approaching it is from a food system transformation perspective. Um, engaging government specifically on what they want to attain with regard to food security of their county. And slowly the picture starts to unfold on the key policies that are important uh, for this outcome to be achieved. In soils, 
um, just recently I was sharing with Lee earlier on uh, that we've had to do extent, extensive soil health testing where we are looking at um, the composition of soils, we're looking at uh, soil organic matter, we're looking at the physical and chemical composition for us to understand the impact of regenerative practices um, on the soil. How we present this to government, however, is not in the numbers, in the pH, and et cetera, et cetera. We are still focusing it on the productivity of uh, the smallholder uh, farmers uh, and the food security agenda uh, of these counties. So it's a mix of policies that lead towards how soils are managed. Uh, and that is what is unfolding. That We need to look at this in an integrated uh, manner. Um, we built this work on the back of work we, were, we had with UNEP uh, and the Global Environment Facility in Western Kenya around the preservation of the Kakamega forest because we saw farmers encroaching and reducing the size of the forest. Uh, and we know how that forest is important for the soil health, for water management, et cetera, not only for that region, but for a good part of Kenya as well. And at that place, uh, our entry points were around the forest management, food security, and the private sector interventions, how we get private sector to um, invest uh, in, 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 in businesses or smallholder farmers, because ultimately all these affect soil health. So it was called a sustainable land management project, had a heavy component on uh, carbon, soil testing, soil quality, but also on restoration of that landscape. Um, for it to become more and more productive for the smallholder farmer, as well as communities that use it for livelihood. So from these examples, you can see that, you know, we could have just gone and done soil health policy. Uh, but I think it was more impactful to look at these landscapes from an integrated manner and deal with the issues of soil health within the livelihood um, of the communities that benefit from these landscapes. So that's one big lesson that has come out of um, the work that we've been doing in Kenya. In West Africa, we've got various um, interventions there, um, but let me just mention the work around the fertilizer quality regulation that we've been working at regional level uh, and helping countries domesticate this because it's got a direct effect on how they manage soil because of the poor quality of fertilizer, poor use of fertilizer, et cetera. So the issue of microdosing, for example, the issue of uh, blended fertilizer, exam for example, these are all context-specific issues that are emanating from this regional policy that West Africa has agreed on, but needs to be domesticated at policy level using country context-specific issues. So there's a number of issues coming from the work that we're doing, um, but let me stop it at now uh, this for now, uh, and let us have um, a, a discussion around some of these experiences that we are getting on the ground and feeding into policies that directly affect how we manage our soils. Thank you. Asan, thank you so much. And before I go to Mateus, I just would like to give you 30 seconds um, to elaborate on something you said about how we communicate. And even you were saying you didn't share the pH values, you related it to food security. Um, so I think knowing your audience is really important. So in 30 seconds, could you just give some of us scientists on the call how we could be more effective in getting our evidence and data um, to the policymakers in a form that's usable? What, what would be some helpful framing? Yeah, and, and I think I, I'm also one of those people that struggles with getting the technical language out of what I typically do into a space where I'm dealing with um, people who are policymakers, county assembly um, uh, representatives, etc. So what we can do better is really try to understand our context a little bit uh, better. If we co-develop some of these programs that we implement on the ground, the methodologies that we implement are scientific, but however, the engagement has to be something that is practical, something that solves problems um, of policymakers, which is usually information gaps, uh, targeting. So we really need to try and understand the environment that we work in and tailor our messages uh, in, that, um, in that manner. And let me just you know, quickly touch on what Munyeu said earlier on, the issue of political will. 
a lot of talk has been going on for quite a number of years around political will. And over the years, we've seen convergence of ideas and we actually hear our politicians and our policymakers speak about the things that matter. However, this is not yet translating into budgets. It's not yet translating into programs on the ground. And for me, it takes the whole idea of political will to another level. Political will should now be the budget for soil health, the budget for food system transformation. Uh, it's not enough anymore to say, yeah, I, I, I agree with this particular stance, I agree with the evidence. What we need to do is now transform this evidence into the actual budgets that we make on an annual basis, on a three-year basis, so we see action on the ground. Thank you. Uh Asan, thank you so much. And I hope that tonight you can get a full night's rest, but I couldn't even tell you just got off a overnight flight. You're just so articulate and I love it. That's the new slogan, translating it into budget, budget for soil health. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you and the work that Agra is doing. And um, I'm so pleased to bring uh, my next guest and I will share the only word I can say properly, I think in Polish, Dzień dobry. And Mateusz is, a, a farmer in Poland, and he's also with many, many organizations, including the European Carbon Farmers and others. So I'll let you fully introduce yourself. And, and also, after you're done introducing, I would like to start off with you sharing some of your experience um, with the EU soil mission and what that process has been like, because the EU is really rallying now around soil and putting out a number of horizon um, proposals on soil and really investing in soil. So like Asan said, with the budget for soil at the EU level. So please go ahead and introduce yourself and um, share your experience. Thank you, Lee. It's a great pleasure to be here and Jin uh, Dobry to those of you who speak Polish. And I know we have uh, a few of us who speak Polish on this call or Dobry uh, Wieczór or Good Evening, depending on where in the world you are tuning into. Um, three quick things from me to mention and then a brief but hopefully comprehensive uh, deep dive into EU soil mission. Um, as way of introduction, I am a farmer who is on a mission of building a farmer-centric bridge between climate change and agriculture policy approaches, uh, using carbon farming as a language to build that bridge. Not carbon payments, but carbon farming. Um, um, I also run two businesses, one uh, European Carbon Farmers, another one the Farmer Francesco, and I sit on a few boards, one of which is the board to the European Commission, supporting European Commission in, in uh, designing and implementing uh, EU soil mission uh, approach. Um, before diving into soil mission of the European Union, uh, let me say two things. It's a huge pleasure to be here and congratulations for organizing. I've learned already a, a lot from the chat and the previous speakers and, and uh, such a pleasure to be here uh, and it's just spectacular. And, and that's the second point I also wanted to mention. Uh, we would not be where we are when it comes to soil policy, soil uh, advocacy, soil approaches, soil uh, action, if not for the cash, for the UN Food System Summit and the cash that emerged out of that. So I think it's, it's uh, I cannot stress that enough, but, but the work cash is doing, the secretariat, different entities of the cash together with partners among which we are, uh, we are very pleased to be to be partners of cash. Uh, it's just spectacular. And um, if you are not engaged yet with the cash, do get engaged and you will change the world uh, because we need to change the world. And that is already happening. And this is where EU soil mission comes comes in. Um, EU soil mission is a is a, a mechanism of the European Union that is one of and probably the key mechanism to deliver on very ambitious goals of the of the union, um, but I believe very achievable if we already are on those goals, um, which is to have 100% of soil in the European Union, including agriculture, but that goes for any soil, forestry, uh, city soil, post-industrial soil, any soil you can name, uh, to be healthy by the year 2050, uh, with minimum or ideally positive uh, soil footprint outside of the European Union territory. So it's about global cooperation. That's very important for the Union. Uh, and we, or the, 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 the soil mission is 
achieved or implemented so far by 2030 by establishment of 100 living labs and demo, demo farms across Europe, which actually are much more than 100 because one is a lot of farms in at least three member states. Uh, so, so a lot of on the ground demo projects. And for that, for promotion of those ambitions, for establishment of those demo labs uh, and lighthouses uh, and living labs, uh, and for uh, global cooperation as well, as Lee said, there is uh, a lot of budget and more budget coming up through Horizon Europe course, because uh, EU mission is effectively overseeing part of Horizon Europe budget, which is European Union's budget for uh, innovation uh, and research uh, to direct it to soil health while connecting the dots with those various policies that we mentioned. So I'm very happy to say we do have a budget in the European Union for that. We do need, in my view, uh, we do need uh, guidance of this ambition, healthy soil as the basis for everything, for healthy food, healthy human being, healthy society, so more than an individual, but, uh, but part of society or societal approach. And finally, national security, which is much kind of rigid, top-down language. We, we cannot have any of those things as uh, or without soil health. And let me just say uh, three very specific things to, to don't ramble on because I can do that very easily about the mission, but just very, very specific three things. Uh, one, the easiest way to get to know about the, the mission, uh, because there's a lot there and different things might be interesting for different stakeholders, just go to the CASH website and in the policy section, which I put in the chat, there are two links to the mission, or one is to the European Soil Strategy, which mission is part of or is working under. Another one is to the Soil Mission Manifesto, which everyone, individual organization, everyone is invited to sign. And I would argue you should sign it and read it and go deeper into every single, you know, even sentence that is written there because, because th there's a lot just in one page of, uh, of content uh, that you know, I'm sure you will be moved to go in this or other direction as a business or as a, or as a farm um, with that document. There is another very specific project supported by the mission, um, which job is to explain the mission to different stakeholders. So if you want to learn more, you want to call somebody, you want to organize a call, you, uh, you want to follow the open calls, nation.eu is the website that is in the chat right now and is the place to go when it comes to um, to learning more and going deeper. And of course, I'm here for you as well. So feel free to, to reach out to me in, in a mode that is most effective. Uh, and then final point I would like to mention is uh, I really love the clarity of, uh, of vision of both the cash and all the speakers that we have so far in this meeting, because it's really simple. Like soil is important. There is a lot to celebrate with the soil, including at COP28, COP27, COP26, and you name it. But there's still a lot to go in order for it not to be just somewhere on the side celebrating in a close group of people. Sometimes it happens, but to be really guiding our policy making. And of course, we are working on getting that through at the European level. That level of ambition is very clear. But then you ask average farmer in Poland or European Union, is he or she aware of this goal? Unfortunately, very often the answer is no. So there's a big job to be done in order to connect with stakeholders. And I can assure you everyone in this call has a positive story to share as how you, mm. uh, he or she or your organization or all of that is taking action to deliver tangible results when it comes to, to soil health work and enhancement. Um, and final point in there is uh, taking that to political level. So sharing that story with your elected members of parliament and European parliament, uh, with your government and your opposition, because seats change and people <laughs> who are in opposition then govern you and so on. It is really important. I know from my own experience of working on that for three years, it's not easy. Sometimes you want to quit and you want to say, hey, we are going nowhere and mm -hmm. we are going backwards or whatever. Um, but it seems to be the way it is. The political dimension which we are discussing right now and policy making is, I would argue, the critical missing step uh, to, to get it from 
where we are right now, which is really exciting space to get mm -hmm. it to subsidies that are aligned with our uh, ecosystems and are empowering for the farmers and other soil stakeholders, because let me remind you, soil is not only about agricultural soil, that's very important, but all other soils. Great. So let me Thanks, stop Patrice. here. Great. Um, yeah, over to Louis. Uh, Lee. Yeah. Actually, you know, that. thank you so much for those very concrete points. And it also aligns with what Jack was saying. We need to just simply invite more policymakers to the room. And now you've expanded on that. That is your all from all of the different spheres and also key messaging. And thanks for also saying we've been having a great time raising awareness and rallying. And now we really need to get to those critical steps about soil health and the policy. So your, your insights are so valuable. Thank you so much for taking time to be here. I'm not even going to ask you what country you're in because I, if, if I guess it'll be the wrong continent. So thank you so much. And I'm, and I'm so pleased now to introduce our next guest and just reminding everyone that we, we still have a half hour. Um, so we're right on time. And so Hasib, I, I will first ask you to introduce yourself. And, and then I want to just say how pleased I am that you're here because now you're going to give us a tangible tool that countries can use to integrate different aspects of food systems, soil health into their NDCs. And I just love that now we're just really going into solutions. Um, and so please, uh, the floor is yours. And when you're ready, you can share your screen. Thank you so much for joining us, Hasib, to you. Thanks, Lee, and thank you for the invitation. It's truly an honor to be part of this panel and to present our tool that we have developed with uh, WWF and several other partners, including partners in cash. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here. I am a senior consultant with Climate Focus. Uh, Climate Focus is a think tank slash consultancy uh, that works on climate solutions across sectors. At Climate Focus, I work on climate solutions and food systems that deliver uh, both planetary benefits as well as benefits for people. And particularly, or more specifically, I work on how we can integrate climate solutions and food systems in our policies, uh, specifically the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. That's because nationally determined contributions have become the policy vehicle to communicate national ambitions on climate change mitigation adaptation, as well as strategies to achieve those ambitions. So integrating or taking a more holistic approach to policymaking as part of the NDC processes are key to actually deliver on the Paris Agreement targets. Um, that's also because uh, our food systems they are responsible for more than a third of global emissions. And at the same time, they also uh, have uh, the greatest uh, potential to uh, achieve the Paris Agreement targets and goals because 80% of the natural climate solutions lie in our food system. So without transforming our food systems, we cannot really uh, even think of achieving the Paris Agreement targets of 1.5 or 2 degrees. Um, in addition to achieving the targets of Paris agreements, transformation, transformation and food system delivers from food security, biodiversity, health, uh, animal welfare, you name it, across the sectors, we will, uh, we will achieve our policy goals if we really uh, change how we produce, consume uh, food. Uh, however, past several years, we have closely looked at the national determined contributions and how they integrate the food systems approach. So taking a more holistic approach to food production and consumption. Uh, and we realized that most of the NDCs actually lack this holistic approach. They still take that sectoral approach on en uh, taking en making energy targets or transportation targets or uh, urban and industry, industry uh, sector targets, but this holistic approach uh, was missing. Uh, therefore, last year, together with WWF and other partners, we thought it would be good to put together uh, a website or a tool that uh, provides uh, a start point to policymakers with uh, policy options that can be integrated in the NDCs and implemented as part of NDCs to really uh, integrate food systems approach, basically in national climate policy making and policy implementation. 
and the result of that uh, the, that project that uh, that process is a website and it's uh, I'll, I'll show the website now it's uh, going to be a living website uh, and it will continuously be updated and improved uh, as new knowledge and new uh, scientific data comes in uh, and as new guidance is available in literature for policy making and implementation we will improve uh, the material on the website i'll quickly share my screen and please let me know if you can see my screen perfect we see it action on food awesome um so the name of the website is food forward in dcs uh, the aim is to provide policy options for policymakers in integrating food systems approach in NDCs and their implementation. Again, this has been a collaborative approach uh, project and will continue to be so. So this is the landing page and users can get started and the website has grouped policy options across different buckets in, uh, based on the food uh, value chain or food supply chain starting with food environment, food governance, food production, food supply chain, and food consumption. For each of these, uh, there are different policy options that can be explored. I'll go to food production where uh, our, the topic of this conversation uh, is embedded, soil health. If, you, if the users click on food production, uh, menu will drop down with different policy options on what can we do to improve food production for climate change mitigation adaptation, uh, including transitioning to nature positive and climate resilient freshwater management, land use uh, change reduction, implementing sustainable fisheries, and sequestering carbon in soil and enhancing soil health in crop systems. As we know, soil soil has soil is the base of food. Most of our food comes from soil. That's it. And soil is also home for the, the most biodiverse ecosystem. So without taking action in, our, uh, in improving our soil, we cannot really transform our food system. That, that's been also clear from all other uh, speakers today. And once users click on uh, this policy option, then the website will present um, basically a page that has a table of contents here on the left where we have the overview, which describes why uh, in enhancing soil health is important for food systems. And then it presents more concrete measures to implement. Uh, so more concrete policy of, uh, measures to implement uh, at the food production level, at the farm level. And then uh, it also presents more enabling environment or enabling govern governance measures that governments need to take in order to uh, allow farmers to uh, change their practice to more sustainable practices to, to enhance soil health. It also provides tools that can be used in quantifying, for example, emission uh, savings in uh, from soil, improved soil pra uh, practices, or for monitoring uh, in policy implementation for improving soil health and, and so on. It, also includes a section on benefits. So the climate ch change mitigation benefits of in, uh, improving soil health, other climate and ecosystem benefits, the, the adaptation co-benefits also provides information on how improving soil health can contribute to sustainable development goals of the countries and other benefits. But in, uh, what is also important that it also includes some of the challenges in implementing these policies and possible externalities and trade-offs of some of these policy decisions. So the decision making, make us uh, are aware that not everything comes, uh, that things also come with some costs and those need to be taken into consideration in policy development and implementation, coming back to the stakeholder engagement and the multi-stakeholder approach to policy making. So there lies the solution to have a more uh, multi-stakeholder approach to policy making to minimize these challenges and trade-offs. Um, we also have brought uh, literature on some of the costs or examples of costs, how much 
some of these practices, implementing some of these practices can cost in different countries as just a general example for policymakers to be aware of. Uh, and then uh, it provides an examples in practice how these projects have been implemented in different countries, in different sector uh, contexts, uh, and additional resources for uh, uh, exploring, basically. Again, I want to uh, emphasize that policy making and policy implementation have to be context specific. We have uh, made sure that we never say that we, these are policy options that are context specific. Uh, however, these are based on literature, including IPCC and academic literature and provides a landing basically base for policymakers to start from and then based on the local context, local stakeholder consultations, implement uh, policies and uh, policy actions that are suited for, for those contexts. But this is a starting point. I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Hasid, thank you so much. And actually stay here for, okay, I was going to say such a, a wealth of information because I think we've been talking at this webinar about how to bring information to policymakers. And I think this is a fantastic example, giving things from price, entry point, um, practices on the ground for each one of these nature-based solutions. And I just want to congratulate you and the team. And the other reason why I love having you on this panel is because you're not a PhD soul scientist. You're someone who is coming at this from a different angle and, and realizing, oh my goodness, soil health is important for um, climate, for restoration, for all these other works. And I just wanted to appreciate that um, we said last year, I think it was um, Honorable Penny from Australia said, we cannot talk to the choir. We need to reach out and, and you know engage with other organizations and people. And I just think that you're, the way you were just explaining soil carbon and the benefits was just so powerful. And I, I wanted to thank you um, very much. And so now just in, in maybe one or two minutes now, what's the plan? Is there a way for you to track how countries are using this? Or are you going on a road show to countries? And remember what Matthias said, not just your political party, but even the opposition. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Yes, indeed. So now that the, the tool is out there, launched, the next step is to talk to policymakers and other stakeholders uh, on the ground to see how uh, they find the tool and how the tool can be useful for them in helping them make uh, decisions around you know, climate change solutions in, uh, in the food systems. We'll collect uh, inputs from policymakers in uh, six, seven countries where we are planning to have dialogues with policymakers and other stakeholders, and then hopefully uh, have more time to change anything if needed uh, on the website to align it with the needs of the policymakers on the ground. And we'll also host webinars such as this uh, to socialize the tool as well as take input from uh, users and uh, yeah, improve, improve the tool as much as possible. Because at the end, this is for users uh, uh, and it must be helpful for them. So if something is not helpful, we need to change that. That uh, sounds like a great strategy, and I believe the tool was officially launched last week at the United Nations Environmental Assembly. I was there, we were celebrating it, and um, really, and then closed out the UNEA 6 with a luncheon with private sector, uh, government, uh, research, uh, and talking about key entry points for food systems and soil health uh, in 2024 and beyond. So Hasid, thank you so much and congratulations. And I'm really, Pleased to have our next uh, panelist, um, Jenna. Yay, there she is. So um, I'm a big fan of YPARD and of Jenna, and also Cash really has uh, a, a you know a, a, a commitment to making sure the voice of youth is included in these conversations. So Jenna, I would like to give you the floor 
to introduce yourself, introduce YPARD, and then you have an audience here. You have policymakers, you have scientists. This is your moment. What is your ask? What is the role of youth? What do you want us to do better? So over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I mean, of course, we always want everyone to do better on youth inclusion, and we want folks to do better on soil health. So that's a really easy answer, I think, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in my intervention. So thank you for having me. And for those of you who might not know us yet or have heard why part, but have been a little bashful to ask what it stands for, we are the Young Professionals for Agricultural Development. And we're a network of young people under the age of 40 working all across the value chains in agriculture and food systems. We have members in 65 countries and a network reach of 30,000 young people. Within being a network, we have two main areas of programmatic work, capacity building and knowledge management and advocacy. And those really work hand in hand. But before I go further, we've already used the word youth several times. And I've been asked here to talk about youth and the role of youth in policy. And I've learned over the years that it's actually really, really important to clarify who youth are, because I've found that a lot of us are operating with some assumptions. So according to the High Level Panel of Experts or the HLPE report to the CFS, on youth engagement and employment and food systems, youth is actually best described as a conceptual definition. However, of course, we need practicality and sometimes we need an age cutoff for youth, like when we're gathering data sometimes. And we have a bulk of UN data which refers to youth as 15 to 24. But sometimes this data connection collection can range to 29, especially when we're looking at entry to the job market, for example. But in the African Union, we consider youth up to the age of 35, or in the UNFCCC processes, the youth constituency is up to 35. And in Malaysia, youth is even defined up to the age of 40. So we see a huge variation in the definitions of youth. But in the end, defining youth is about roles and relationships to others. And why is it important for young people to team up with you in policy advocacy or in the reverse for you all to team up with us. There's increasing recognition that youth are an indispensable stakeholder group. And we've seen that increase so much over the last 10 years. As our farming populations age all over the world, we realize that we really need to empower young people to take leadership both today and tomorrow. We know from EFAD and FAO reports that young people report that a lack of agency and agri-food systems is a key reason why we do not wish to enter careers in agri-food systems, lack of agency. So at YPARD, we're working to change that. We're working together with all of you to change that by involving, involving our members in policy and teaming up with groups like CASH, for example, who are committed to topics which touch our work, like soil health, that are so important to making a really healthy agri-food system. So how are young people, especially YPART, involved in policy advocacy? Well, YPART has a policy working group, which has a dual purpose, which fits those pillars of work that I told you about at the beginning, capacity building and advocacy. We get young professionals together to learn about policy. And by going through that process of learning about the policy and policy fora, then we also are able to articulate our views for representation in diverse fora and platforms. We actually send our members to these diverse fora and platforms to really get their hands dirty in representing themselves at the policy forum. A great example of this is YPAR members being involved in consultative processes for country level strategies. For example, in Kenya and Nigeria, our YPAR members have been involved in consultations for country level food security strategies, excuse me, county level, and national youth strategies. This is important because a great deal of policy action, as we know, happens at the country level or even the county level or municipality level. Since we're a global organization and a lot of the organizations in this call are, we also recognize the importance of the coordinating role 
that the UN has in policy matters related to food and agriculture and can make a really big difference on matters that are really important to us like soil health. Our members are eager to also understand how these intra-governmental policy spaces work. So we've been very involved in the advocacy processes at the UNFCCC, for example. We've been having capacity building webinars with our membership in coordination with FAO, UNGO, and other actors. And we're a very, very active part of the youth constituency, UNGO. The positions of our working group flow into the policy positions published by UNGO. So we play a really active role in bringing up topics that are dear to young professionals in these cult processes. We also recognize the importance of all the real conventions. And we have a really unique opportunity this year because all of the real conventions are happening this year. We can't reach any of the goals we're talking about that we want to achieve without also thinking about soil. If we aren't thinking about land degradation, if we aren't thinking about biodiversity. So this year, YPART is also working in cooperation with a lot of different actors, but um, also the um, Swiss government with EIT Food to get involved in the CBD and the um, UNCCD this year. This is a landmark year, and this is a really unique opportunity to bring our voices into these fora and to team up with you all to do that. So my take home message, team up with us at the national level by inviting youth organizations like YPARD, but also others to your consultations and on a regular basis. Team up with us on your advocacy at the Rio conventions, for example, on a regular basis. Create projects with us to educate young people and provide us opportunities to really take action and get our hands in that soil for soil health so that we can really make some of these exciting programs happen. Like we were hearing some of our colleagues talk about that there's actually funding opportunities opening up to make action happen. We're an important voice and an energetic actor, and we're well-placed to make persuasive arguments for the future of food systems. After all, we're not only the leaders of tomorrow, but we are also the leaders of today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, Jenna, it's so inspiring when you talk. <laughs> if we were in a room, there would be this, you know, standing ovation. I love that important voice, energetic voice, and also knowledgeable and just bringing this perspective. Absolutely love it. And I think we're already finding some touch points and entry points for these upcoming COPs. So as we move forward and we're planning, let's definitely discuss uh, collaboration. And I'm also inspired to hear that in the country where I am, in Kenya, that there has been some engagement. So I would definitely want to follow up and I'm sure Asan will as well. So if I could just get Anne or Hana to spotlight all the panels so we'll just spend the next 15 minutes answering questions from the um, participants and from the in the chat. And so, Jack, I hope that you've noticed um, some questions about data, benchmarking, evidence. So please make sure everyone puts their um, questions in the chat. But Jack, I noticed quite a few um, about data and monitoring and setting baselines. So you're my natural go-to for that. So uh, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, yeah sure, that's no problem. Uh, so linked, I guess, to some of the policy work happening in the UK, there is um, a national monitoring program that is is currently um, happening at the moment. So they're out in the field taking samples that because this was one of our recommendations from the last health soil health inquiries, but we don't have an understanding about the state of soils in the UK. So if we're not measuring them, how do we know which direction of travel that they're going in? So this was actually a positive outcome from the former health inquiry that they are now um, collecting data for baseline. And that should be ready. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. But by, I think, 2028, they will have a, an understanding. It will be a national picture because it's at the granularity for kind of policy decisions. Probably, and what we've been pushing is actually more granular data on the ground. So exactly some of these studies that that people have been talking about is, is actually saying, well, what actually works in practice? How can we demonstrate within this context that this particular sort of management action is going to have a potential benefit? And 
So there is still work to do, <laughs> I would say, in thinking about also integrating different types of, of information and data that's actually useful for farmers on the ground. So going back to Asan's point about that translation of what does it mean in terms of the pH or the nitrogen family? What what can I do now with that information to Im improve soils? Um, and I, I don't know, Mateus probably has more idea about the EU, but the e EU soil there is a soil health law that is has been launched as part of the um, of the of that policy work, and that is specifically related to monitoring. So there is a requirement for member states to be doing soil monitoring in in the member states again to have this kind of national baseline. Great, thank you so much. And then I think just staying on this idea of evidence and data. And please, if someone has a question, please write it in the chat and then you uh, may invite you to ask it live. Um, Manyewu, I know we're talking so much about policy and about, um, you know, how we can really translate this onto the ground. And I was just wondering from your perspective, when you're in all these discussions, when you were writing, um, co-authoring the declaration for the Africa Food so Africa Fertilizer and Food Soil Health Summit. Um, what, what were there discussions about data? Was there a discussion about the lack of data, the need for data? Because I think it, in Cash we have the monitoring working group, and we're really committed to that. And we'd just love to hear, you know, what the discussions have been. And please don't say it's, you know, scientists are terrible, terrible, and at communicating. <laughs> Over to you. Give us some insights. No, you can say that. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks, Lee, for, for for that. Definitely, you know, data information, soil information systems are a huge part of the conversations that we've had, not only in the technical working group, I must say, but also uh, beyond that. And I'm sure you 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 are part of the group that's actually meeting in Nairobi at the, towards the end of the month. To talk about uh, to talk about this, so it's really been a key part of the conversations that we've been uh, having, and uh, um, to a large extent as well, we have put in recommendations in terms of uh, key actions that we want uh, member states to 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 explore and to to look at very seriously in terms of how to ensure that we we increase access to soil information and it's actually utilized because you know that there are all kinds of systems that are available that are out there that have been developed by different um, different players on the landscape but it, when it comes to the utilization for decision making at the different levels all the way to the farmer level that's where we we have issues and the the endeavor is to actually say how do we move from having all these nice tools, but that are not currently being used. So that's the challenge that we want to try and overcome. And uh, hopefully we're starting to see movement in that direction, but definitely a subject matter and definitely at the top of the agenda in terms of what we are recommending for attention, not only at the summit, but also for some. Thanks. Yes. Yes, at the summit and post summit where the implementation will be on the ground. Um, Mateus, I see um, a question here from Cordelia. I don't know, Cordelia, if you're still here and you want to ask it live. Let me give you a, one second to see if there's Cordelia. Yes, please. Yeah, hello. Ask your Hi. question. Live. Introduce yourself. Hi, yes, my name is Cordelia and I work for an organization called the Soil Association. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, I guess I was just trying to connect um, what you were saying, Mateus, with um, the international focus of this webinar. Um, yeah, the AI for Soil Health project has been working to create a sort of um, a digital twin in Europe for soils um, and be able to inform policy decisions and also farmers and people who are working on their land with what um, interventions to make. Um, and yeah, I just wondered what the sort of vision or what the aim would be to connect this sort of work that we're doing um, further than the four years um, of the project and kind of, 
you know, internationally and beyond. So, I mean, any ideas, even if they're high level. Thanks. Great. And thank you so much um, for also having the confidence to ask your question live. So, <laughs> so exactly. Matthias, go for it. Your exactly, question. Exactly. Exactly. And thank you for your work with uh, uh, AI for Soil Health. Uh, I, I'm aware of the project as a mission board member, and we support all the projects of Horizon Europe finance through the mission very much. Um, and and in there is uh, this kind of not high level but less tangible, not you know not something that you have to do, but but what you could do and what would be amazing to do. Part of the answer, which is connect with the other projects, be part of venues like this one. Uh, once again, connect with your policymakers to inform what you do, to share the level of ambition, saying, hey, we are here. Our next step, one, two, three, is this, this, and that. But we are doing this because we later on want to you know, achieve this, this impact. Uh, and, and international collaboration is something that, well, you have to, you have to initiate, but then you have to be open for life just happening there i know something about that just returning from the us where magic happened uh but w if we were not you know fully present in that uh we w we would come back with the polish delegation would come back with a lot of preconceptions that um were turned into amazing fruitful opportunities for, for collaboration in in various fields in agriculture so so this is this is high level answer meaning do what you are doing uh, have high level of uh, ambition, very high level of ambition. Uh, so, uh, like um, fill that up with very concrete goals and objectives to um, to one of the questions in the chat that I also engage with. Like, like you have to dream, but you have to act very concretely today, tomorrow, you know, next week, um, and and showcase your progress. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the EU project specifically, and I shared that with you, Cordelia, in the in the chat. I forgotten to include the link, which now I included, so you have that in the chat. There is a work program, which is like the technical document saying we will do this by this year, and those are our objectives that the mission will be evaluated on by um, by relevant authorities of the European Union. So, uh, like when you are looking for hard data. It's in that document, and that document mm. is is very important. Uh, I'm not encouraging anyone to go there and and go very deep in that, but if you want <laughs> to be strategic about that, this is the document. But don't forget to dream as you are reading that, uh, because you <laughs> have to ask how we how we follow that up, how we implement that, and you are certainly doing amazing work by being mm. here, just like everyone else by being here. Thanks, Matthias. That's Thanks so great. So okay. We have uh, four minutes left, so that is about 30 seconds each person. I'm going to start with Asan, then I'm going to go to Jenna and Asif. And what is your take home message? You've been in this space. We have three COPs, the summit. We have these policy webinars. We all have our institutional goals. What is some take home message in literally 30 seconds? I'll put my timer on. So Asan, you're first. Inspire us. Well, thanks so much. Um, in 30 seconds, really, uh, for me, it's about action on the ground and therefore uh, budgets is key. Um, we always talk about having um, non-bankable projects, but I think the key here is to have budgets that are available aligned with programs on the ground. So budgets is key for us to get soil health going. Okay, Jenna, sorry, but he was totally on time. Now you have to follow that. So Jenna Hasib, and then I'm going to ask Grace to come in for Pamela. Okay, Jenna. Yeah, no problem. I mean, work with youth for your efforts, whether that's in policy engagement or the practical implementation. We have boots on the ground. We have our high heels in the policy rooms. So get in touch with us, and we're really willing to work together. Hey, that was 13 seconds and really powerful. Thank you, Hasib. Go for it. And then we'll go to Grace and then Jack. Thanks. The momentum for food systems and soil has never been better, but we need to move away from commitments and declarations to action. And one way to do that is, to do that is socialize this tool and help policymakers in identifying and implementing the most context-specific and uh, uh, effective 
policy options and measures. This is so fantastic. And just so the audience knows, the participants, they, they got no warning that, that I was going to do this. So um, <laughs> I'll be getting some uh, angry emails later. So uh, Grace and then Mati uh, Jack, Matias, and then Maniewu. So Grace, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, our main take home is that the soil health policy is actually complex. Uh, there are very many other factors other policies of similar nature that must feed into it. So that means must be very consultative uh, between interagencies within the government and even if possible, externally with other governments. And also uh, the inclusion of youth is very key. Importantly in Uganda, our population is about 70% youth. So we must bring them to the table, invite them for this discussion. Thank you very much, over. Great, and I'm so glad we got your voice in here, Grace. Jack, then Mateus, go for it. Uh, yeah, well, just a quick one, really, about it kind of brings together some of the comments already, but to, to develop these kind of overarching national strategies or policies for soil, they sit in lots of different places at the moment, usually, which is fine for kind of delivering that ambition, but to really set the direction of travel, to put soils on the stage with air and water where we have you know, national strategies for those, but really to make sure that it's not all top down to ensure that that policy is really co-developed with everybody, all of those actors we talked about from farmers through to youth so that, that the implementation can happen and the finance can happen for the implementation of, the, of those strategies and policies. That's Fabulous. my take. Thank you, Matthias. And then we'll close out with Manyewu who picked us off on the webinar. So go Matthias. Amazing. Uh, great points, everyone. From my end, it is visit a farmer or other land manager if you are not one of the land managers, uh, for example, a forester. And if you are a land manager, tell your story to others who are not land managers of how you do that. And to politicians out there, any level from the lowest to the highest, you, it's, it is on you to advance soil action. Uh, a lot of other actors are already working on that. We need level of ambition, commitment, and follow through from the political sector to really uh, go from where we are right now to full transformation. Thank you. And Manyewu, Dr. Mutamba, please, your, your takeaway. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so degradation on the African continent has reached uh, calamitous proportions. Let's not waste this crisis. This year is the year for soil health. Let's ride the wave of the highest level of political commitment. I look forward to seeing all of you at the summit. Thank you so much. Amazing. And can we just give everyone a big round of applause? Thank you so much for dedicating your time. And let's make sure everything we've learned here today, we, you know, bring it to action. And I would thank everyone. We have a webinar on um, investing in soil health on April 11th, and one on monitoring and science on the 2nd of May, just before the summit. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. And let's keep working working together to make sure that we're scaling soil health and uh, globally together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone Thank who joined. So Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.